You're listening to Canada Reads American Style, the only podcast by two librarians from Michigan who love Canada Reads and Canadian literature. Welcome our hosts, tech guru, baker, and historical romance reader Shauna, and content provider, dog lover, and nonfiction and realistic fiction reader Rebecca. Hello, and welcome to Canada Reads American Style. I'm Shauna. And I'm Rebecca. And earlier this year, our guest, author and publisher Heather Down, reached out to us and asked if we would be interested in reading her latest book titled Not Cancelled, Canadian Kindness in the Face of COVID-19. And I am so glad she did because, as you'll figure it out, I love this book. And so, Heather, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much. My pleasure. So we're going to just jump right into it because this is, I'm going to have you kind of describe uh, what the book is about, and then we kind of want to know how you came to write it. And then I'll insert my comments about why I loved it a little bit later. (laughs) Oh, wow. Sounds great. Well, this, this is a collection of stories from across Canada, stories of kindness, and it, it, features 49 stories because Canada is on the 49th parallel and we managed to get a story from at least one from every single province and we have one from a territory because we wanted a cross section a good selection that represented the country and basically they're short either first person essays or narratives about something very simple but a historical social history of what went on during our first lockdown. Yeah, and this is what was really interesting because as I was reading it, you know, even even though it was just a year ago, I kind of it kind of put me back into that place where I was where you know, I it was very stressful for everyone, let's face it, but it kind of puts you back in that mindset. And it's good to know, hey, we're coming out of it and it's all great. But to go back and have that perspective of so many different voices, it, th- that's what I, that's one of the things I loved about it. The other thing I really loved is at the end of each story or each uh, account from an individual account, you put the information in the bio and it often linked to either a viral video or a podcast that someone does or something. And so I spent a lot of time looking up these people and kind of getting a more in-depth picture behind who they are. And so I always love to do that as a reader. And I love that you included that info in the bio. That was fantastic. Well, I'm a lot like you in that I want to know who wrote something or more about them. I'm always interested in the author as much as I am as I am in a story. So that was kind of important to me because it was a showcase of diversity. And uh, I really wanted people to connect personally with with the people. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like absolutely did. And a little bit later, I want to talk about some of the stories specifically that really spoke to me. But I definitely felt that as I was reading their stories and those bios and then doing that little bit of extra research on my own, because Shauna gets on me about this sometimes, but I always need to know the context of what I'm reading. So if I don't understand something, I look it up. So I just like a little extra information. Yeah, me too. Me too. And the way it came about uh, was in our first lockdown in Ontario, where I was living at the time and I've moved since then, it has everything to do with the book. So I might share you a story of something that happened today as well. I realized as an educational publisher, I was no longer relevant because the schools were closed and I had to pivot quickly. And a friend of mine put a simple post on Facebook how laughter wasn't canceled. And she told a little story, a little funny story about a conversation she and her husband had. And that sparked the idea of wow, these kind of little events and kindness and laughter are happening all across Canada and in the world. And someone needs to record this. This is a piece of history during the time that it's actually taking place. At that time, we didn't know how it would turn out. And it was very important to me to continue with that. So I reached out to my friend, Catherine, who is the co-writer. And I said, hey, you know, I really love that Facebook post. Let's take it a step step further. And that's actually how the idea of the book came about. That is really incredible. And do you have any idea whether anyone's done something similar to date? Or did you guys just completely like knock it out of the park right out, you know, just as soon as 
you could, I mean, you put this together very quickly and it's good quality, but I'm assuming that you're way ahead of the, the game on think, everybody else. I right? think we <laughs> are because it took about seven weeks from beginning to end. I didn't sleep. My husband didn't see me at all. <laughs> I was like crazy, but I felt it was important that it come out when some of us were still in lockdown because it was, it's a book of hope. So it was important that it was available to people during this time. I felt it served more of a purpose than just being a book. I felt it was a message. It was kind of a gift. So it was important to do it quickly and good quality because I'm all about that as well. But I think we were not only the first, but one of the the main, at least here, because our largest book seller is a company called Indigo Chapters. And I'm a very small publisher and they called me. So uh, that that kind of says something. They're like, we need to buy a bunch of these because we haven't seen anything like it yet. So I I know we were at least the first, and I haven't seen anything quite like it since. There might be, but I haven't come across it yet. Yeah, I haven't either. And I think I, I think that was so critical, like you said, to get it out while we were still going through it. It's one thing to have that sort of historical perspective after the dust has settled, but it was something that was so important to read, especially during that time, because it was really speaking to us. All of the... Like you said, there's it's definitely uplifting. There's hope. It's love stories. It's beautiful, and we needed it then. And we still need it now as we're trying to come out of all of this mess. And so, yeah, uh, it's just incredible. It's I love it as I said. But now, how did you actually gather the stories? Like, how did you who, how how did you reach out to people, or did they contact you in some way, or how did that whole process go? It was quite a mixed bag. So I started scouring regular media. I started watching the news for any stories. And then I'm I'm a bit like you. I like to research and know context. So I would do what I did on social media and find the people if they were featured in a story and reach out and talk to them directly. Um, so and it became known that we were doing this. So friends would keep their ears out and then people started sending me ideas. And then we also had people contribute directly. We put a call out. So really it was any possible way to get these stories. We, we called upon to do it. And the ones that I wrote, the narratives that I wrote, I wrote um, oh, probably about 40% of the book. Um, I actually interviewed every person. It wasn't like I read their story and just wrote about it. I contacted them. So it was all, you know, one-on-one. And the interesting thing about this is just recently we had some news a couple of weeks ago. So a small theater company in Ontario has picked it up and it has inspired a musical. Oh my gosh, you're kidding. Yeah. That so that's is pretty incredible. Exciting. Yeah. Now, when will, is it, is it out and available yet to, to audiences? Probably not, I guess, because. No. So they're just in the process of um, putting it together and they're using it for their own little theater company. It's a, a youth company and sometime in the summer because they are still in lockdown where they're living they are putting out videos 10 minute videos one a week based on nine different stories so they are only doing it in virtual format but I think it, it's what we need right now as well in that form in that media form so I wouldn't be surprised if in the future they will formalize it and possibly make it a package that other theater companies could could use. That's my hope anyway, yeah. And is, are there links? I mean, can we actually view it now? Is it available for us to see now? Uh, it won't be available until later in the summer, but I'm happy to share that with you at that time. I'm really excited about that personally. I can't wait to see I that. I was so excited. <laughs> it's, you know, it's the kind of thing where you put something out into the world and you hope that it's, positive and has a, a real purpose because that's what art is really it's sharing purpose in my estimation anyway and when you just put it out and then it comes back to you I just it gave me goosebumps when I heard it and a couple of the songs they had written they had recorded one is about take the dark and make it art and it was just beautiful and it was based on kind of a combination of a few of the stories but I, I wept. I literally wept when I heard it. Yeah. Nothing, no feeling like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, now, so then, because you were sort of bringing in all these stories, they were coming to you or you were soliciting them, but how did you, I assume you had to cut some stories or how many did you end up with and how, how did that process go? Because I can't imagine trying to make that decision about what makes it into the book. Well, we had a few stories that overlapped in theme as well. We had a few about addictions that were kind of similar. Um, so that's sort of the way we went about it. If there was overlap, we held it back because this coming September, we are releasing volume number two. So we hung on to them and we're now working on the second one. And it will be a little bit different because people were, were very kind in the beginning because it was new, but then things kind of got old after a year and a half, right? So, so the tone is a little bit different and we're still going through it. So we, we thought it important to document that as well. You know, the different stages of this experience. So that's what we did with the ex extras. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's really, really smart to have that sort of part two kind of a thing, because it is true. Things have changed. I mean, at the beginning, we were all sort of gobsmacked. Everybody was just kind of like deer in the headlights. And then, yeah, people started to settle into some routines or not. And well, in the U.S., I have to say, you know. We had a lot of crazy things going on here during that same time period. So <laughs> you had a lot a, going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Might be a little different than what was going on in Canada, of course. So now I'm just curious, and I know it's like asking a mother who her favorite child is, but I'm wondering if you had any particularly meaningful stories in the book that really spoke to you or really touched your heart. Absolutely. The Spider-Man one. Uh, there's a story about a young father who, because he was an essential worker, didn't want to see his child directly during this time. And he wanted to get the attention of his own son, who is very, very young, like less than a year old, I believe. He dressed up as Spider-Man and that inspired an idea that he would then put a call out on social media to see if any families wanted him to walk by so that their children could see, quote, Spider-Man. And the response was crazy. Meanwhile, a, a young young lad, he was three years old, and this is in Paradise, Newfoundland, just was crazy about Spider-Man and it made his day. But what struck me about this story was the perspective of the mother of the child who saw Spider-Man. Because she said, I don't want my son to look back on this time of history and think about, oh, that's the time when my parents had financial worries, or I was scared of a virus, or, you know, all this trauma. She said, my child will now in 30 years when asked, what do you remember about that pandemic? My child will say, that's when I saw Spider-Man. And to me, that's profound. Like, it's a small thing, but what an impact on that child's psyche. And that just, that one really struck out. Another one is Pluto, a lady that lives in Montreal. And she's end up, I've become good friends with all these wonderful people I've interviewed, which is amazing. But this woman in Montreal, she just put her voice to her little dog, Pluto. And it was so comforting and so cute. If anyone hasn't seen it, Pluto Living, I believe is her social media. It is the sweetest little schnauzer. And what she does with it, with this is so comforting. And I, the first time I saw the very first video she put out talks about how there's a real problem with the four leggeds because, you know, what's with all this toilet paper? Why, why do we not have toilet paper now? And you know, it's going to be okay. And it's done in this really cute voice. I just watched over and over and over again. And she was so generous. And this is a bit of a backstory. I did offer her some funding to contribute to it and when she heard you know my personal struggles she actually sent it right back to me and I was just like floored by her generosity and then um, I guess the third one is a story that didn't make it in the book which uh, I have to tell you about because it's just today what happened so I was looking for a story from New Brunswick and I couldn't find one for the longest time and I did a lot of searches but I did find a media clip about two little clowns walking down a town and down the high street in a town called St. Andrews New Brunswick I never did find out their names never did run the story 
but it alerted me to this town. And we were living in Barrie, Ontario, which is north of Toronto at the time. And my husband wanted to, to open a British shop, but we didn't know where. So we ended up researching St. Andrews, New Brunswick. And uh, about seven weeks ago, we moved here <laughs> because of the clowns. So we didn't, we'd never been here before. We rented a little place and we've now bought a house. We opened a shop and today was the very first day that this British food shop was open. And guess who walked in the front door? No, are you kidding me? Two clowns. They came in. They heard we did a media. There's a local uh, TV station. We did a media thing a couple of weeks ago. And I guess they caught wind that they were the reason that we moved here. And they dressed up in the clown outfits. And they came in. And they had, you know, beautiful flowers for us. And were the most welcoming, lovely couple I've ever met in my life. And they're literally... In, live in the same block of, as the house we bought. Oh my gosh, that is an incredible story. Oh like how gosh. serendipitous is this? So this book of kindness isn't just the story. It's the impact that seems to keep going. Oh, I agree. I think there are so many stories in it. In fact, the one I uh, if, looked it up on, the, on YouTube because I knew there would be a, a news report about it, but the one about the airplane trip over Nova Scotia. Oh my Lord. Wow. That was so impactful. Yeah. Yes. I, he was so humble when I interviewed him, Dimitri Neonakis, um, after the terrible, terrible events that happened, I think it was last April um, in Nova Scotia with a very unfortunate mass shooting and he quietly just you know got in his plane and and did a flight path like over the area where it happened as 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 a heart as a way of saying you know I can't go visit you but I feel for you and it just wow that that one really struck me as well I know because when I looked him up in the news report that I saw he also flies children uh, children with disabilities, he g lets them fly in the plane with him and kind of be co-pilots. And I'm just thinking, boy, talking about an incredible man. I mean, to have discovered that that story and and to know that, you know, he lives in such a generous way, like such a generous spirit. My gosh. Yes. Was incredible. Yes. And he's a businessman. I think he he's, you know, he shares his um, emotional wealth, you know, and I think that's really important. And, and it all always inspires me when I see and hear these types of stories. Yeah. Now I have to laugh because the story, and I was telling Shauna this today, the story that touched my heart the most, and I'm not really sure why it did, because I think there are so many wonderful stories. I mean, I was in tears, happy tears through most of the book. And I was just, like I said, looking things up and enjoying it. But the one that just really struck me was the one about the mother who was a little frustrated with her little toddler. And then she ended up creating this, um, like a fort and having this really face-to-face -face experience with her daughter. And she went from being feeling anxious and frustrated to having this beautiful experience with her child. And that just, that whole story was so well-written. It was such a beautiful story. That's the one that somehow just, I think will always live with me when I think of this book. Yes, that is also a beautiful story. And we actually ran a bit of a contest with our entries. And I think that was second place. Um, the first, the first place was the one about a, a younger guy who was in university and he was staying with his flatmates or apartment mates during the pandemic. And I, I that one is also well-written, but hers I love because it, it, one, it is well-written and she shows not tells. Like she's so good at it. And that's the sign in my estimation of an excellent writer where they don't insult their reader. They just tell their story, but they don't overtell it. And she did such an amazing job. That's, yeah, that's, thank you for saying it because that's exactly, I think that's why it just really grabbed me. Um, and it felt like it, it felt like it was really long, but then when you look at it, you go, it's actually not that long, but it was so dense and just so 
purposeful in its storytelling. Oh my gosh, it was incredible. Now, I do have a question about this because as a librarian, because Shauna and I are librarians uh, and I've worked uh, in archives before, and I want, I was kind of wondering, is there a way that you can ensure that this book will always be accessible for historical purposes? Because as you know, as a publisher, things come in to print and go out of print and then people lose track of things. But I think this is going to be something that, you know, historical researchers are going to want to have access to because it really does capture the moment in Canadian, you know, this whole Canadian COVID experience, right? So I'm wondering, have you thought about how this thing can live on well beyond all of us? That's a fantastic point. And one, to be honest, I hadn't really thought about. However, it is registered with the Library of Canada. You send two copies there, so it will be in the archives there. It's also in digital format. Um, so even if it ever went out of print, it'll be in digital format forever. Um, but I haven't really thought about that. I have reached out. A lot of schools use it. Uh, we also made an educational package, a free educational package that goes along with it. And interestingly enough, one school uh, who used it had their students write the missing chapter. That's one of the assignments to write the missing chapter. And a couple of those are actually making it into volume two, which is kind of cool. So I guess in that we've thought far enough ahead to create this particular lesson plans. I'm a former teacher, so that's kind of where my head went. But uh, and the Library of Canada and the digital edition. Other than that, I haven't really given that much thought, but maybe I should. Yeah, I always think about, I think because I've worked in academic libraries and archives and things, I always do kind of think about when you have something like this, which I think is a real true gift to historical research, it will be in the in the you know way in the future. You want, I just always want to make sure that someone's going to have access to it because especially in libraries, you know, libraries are changing, public libraries are changing so that it's, it's not necessarily about keeping things for longevity. It's often let's move, let's turn it over, turn it over and start weeding things and getting rid of them. But I think something like this, researchers are going to, I mean, this would be such a critical thing. Like I, 100 years from now is what I'm saying. You know, 100 years from now, s people will want to know what we were experiencing and this book tells that story, those stories so well. That's what I'm thinking, so yeah. Very good point. Yeah, so um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, because I, we started, when you reached out to us, it's through Winter Tickle Press. So I kind of wanted to know if you could talk about the press and if you have any new books on the horizon or I'm, I'm not sure like how many books do you publish a year or what tell, tell us a little bit about your business sure sure so um i used to be a teacher and then i got into writing professionally for other publishing houses i have some books published with other publishers and then at some point i kind of turned towards educational publishing it fascinated me and so most of the time winter tickle press publishes works by other people not not me as a writer but because i felt quite drawn and inspired to do this particular title i i jumped in with the writing aspect of it but winter tickle press probably on average maybe four to five titles a year at most, at most, to be honest. We're a small press and the uh, beginnings of it are actually kind of interesting in my mind anyway. So my grand, my grandfather was from Newfoundland and I never have never met him because he passed before I was born. But in the little outport where he lived, he was the mailman and there were no roads to this outport. So in the winter, he'd ha actually have to go by dog sled to get the mail. And then he would go back to the coves and deliver it. But sometimes it was not passable or he'd have to stay overnight. And he would stay at a little place called Winter Tickle Pond. And a tickle in Newfoundland is a body of water between two land masses. And a pond is what I would call a lake. So it's a lake that's still there and it's very cold. So I think maybe that has something to the name, you know, winter tickle because it's very cold. And I always liked it. We used to visit there as kids and I thought it was a cool name. And that's, that's kind of the background, kind of an homage or a salute to my ancestry. 
I love that story. I'm, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I asked because I almost didn't ask specifically, but I'm glad I did. And then how, so how, what kind of books then are there, they're all educational, like support materials for educators or something? Is that kind of what that's, you're publishing? That's what it started. So it started in 2000 and that's what we did up until about uh, 2012. And then I got hooked up with a Canadian actor by the name of Neil Crone. And he had a lot of stuff that he had published through a local newspaper, a column. And uh, I thought that would be a really cool thing to publish. So that kind of pushed Winter Tickle Press into the foray of general trade, but only nonfiction and only things with purpose, only books with purpose. So we do some very important memoirs in my mind. We've got a couple by first responders, a lot to do with mental health, a lot of focused on post-traumatic stress and post-traumatic stress growth. So that's sort of the types of things we focus on. Then I want to ask about your podcast, too, because uh, you mentioned it in the book, in your little bio, in one of the stories about your podcast. And so I listened to it, and it's called After the Book Ends. And it, it, it from what I could see, it started in May of 2019, and then the last one was, I think, December of 20 or something like that. But anyway, I love your concept for that podcast, and I love nonfiction. That's one of my passions in life, to be honest with you. And so I'm wondering, yeah, are you going to continue to do that podcast or is that, are you moving on from that? I want to continue. I just had a lot going on in my life. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the something had to put, yeah, the move, <laughs> I had to put something on hold, unfortunately, but that concept I, I like as well, because there are a lot of beautiful podcasts about books and you're you're the host of one of those but I thought it would be kind of cool to learn more about the author versus the book so after the book ends starts with the last paragraph of the book and then we find out what happened in the author's life after the book was published so it's almost like seeing part number two to get you interested in reading part number one yeah yeah and I have to say, that's, you know, as somebody, again, I'm the same as you in that I, the reason I do all my research to get the context of something is I've I've always loved authors. I don't have writing talent. I'm a librarian who loves to read and I admire authors. So anytime I can listen to an author, I'm all over it. And this podcast is sort of funny in the sense that we, when we started it, it, Sean and I were just going to like do these little reviews. And then we ended up reaching out to our first author and he said yes to an interview and then it's just sort of taken off. And so we've had this great privilege for me to speak to so many authors, which is my passion. I love it. But I love your concept because I love it. After the book ends, that last paragraph, and then you go into that interview. And I just hope and I hope really, really encourage you and hope that you'll continue because I'm a huge fan and I will I will definitely be listening. So oh, thank you. Yes, it's something that I really, really enjoy doing. So the recording space that I used at the time was a walk-in closet because it was very good for sound. <laughs> and, uh, you know, all our stuff is in so this storage right now and we don't have our house. So things are just in flux, but it is my hope to continue. I actually spoke to the local TV station here about possibly bringing it to the screen uh maybe in the fall uh maybe by you know by virtual because a lot of the people that I interviewed weren't close to me I interviewed Theo Fleury who's in near Calgary he's a former hockey player and he's got a fantastic mental health story and I also across the pond interviewed Henry Cole who's quite a well-known personality in Britain I was so surprised that he said yes <laughs> you know you reach out to these people and you think there is no way but he did and that was so much fun so I really really loved it and it is a concept that like you I want to know the context I want to learn about the author's life I just find people fascinating so it is my hope. I, I can't foresee it 
until probably the fall. But once I'm settled, that is on my to do list. So thank you for thank you for listening to it. Uh, oh, absolutely. Well, Heather, I just want to thank you so much for chatting with us today. And I look forward to the second book in, in the series, so to speak. I really do look forward to it. I loved it so much. And I want to encourage even our American listeners, uh, please get a copy of this book, even though it's not necessarily something we'll find on the shelves here in the United States. But I encourage the U.S. listeners to read it as well, because, you know, we're so connected to Canada anyway. Their stories are our stories. And I just think it's such a compelling read, uplifting, beautiful. Thank you so much, Heather, for joining us today. Oh, thank you. And uh, I think through Amazon, they do have extended distribution, so it is possible to get it in the in the U.S. as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and tell all your friends about Canada Reads American Style. Bye.